Good morning and welcome to Stonehill College. I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to kick off this morning's program. We were saying back in October when we chose the date with Stonehill College to kick off our first of the season or, or the years, uh, Good Morning Metro South, that uh, we knew this morning would snow because it snowed, for those of you who've been here, it snowed on this event uh, for the last four years. And uh, so uh, we're going to let the DPWs know that in the future so they can prepare for the snow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about Stonehill College. First of all, we are so fortunate to have this institution uh, in our community here. Uh, as you can see, uh, it is just simply a beautiful campus. And with the snow and walking through the woods, uh, it's just so peaceful and so... Uh, so it adds so much to the lives of, of the people who live in this area. I know my wife and my kids will come out here every now and then and we'll go for a walk on the campus and, and just uh, take a look around. It's just, uh, we're just so blessed to have this campus here. Uh, this, this building is one of the very few, in fact, I was told it was the first ever uh, public uh, building uh, situated on a private Catholic college campus in America. And it was uh, dedicated to Martin, Joe Martin, who was the Speaker of the House. In fact, there's a photo of uh, Ronald Reagan and Joe Martin and the, uh, pres and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the president of Stonehill College uh, in the next room talking a little bit about the history. But I wanted to just acknowledge that uh, this institute was really a pu for public use and for meetings like this to talk about issues that impact uh, the community and the region. Uh, in fact, they have a fantastic uh, schedule of events that come come up on a regular basis. I just want to kind of feature some of those because they're coming up. So a panel on uh, radical populism is uh, scheduled here for February 5th. Uh, former Black Panther Jamal Joseph will be here February 15th. Uh, candidate for the Democratic nomination for governor Seti Warren will speak here on February 26th. <laughs> Re Republican, yeah. <laughs> Republican, and I'm sure the governor will be here as well. Uh, re Republican candidate for U.S. Senate Beth Lindstrom will be here on March 14th, so they have Democrats and Republicans. Uh, a panel on criminal justice reform uh, will be here on March uh, 19th. And uh, these are just a few of the programs that are offered by the Martin Institute and Stonehill College here. So uh, let's have a round of applause for the programming. <laughs> I'd also like to thank Secretary Jay Ash for being here today and braving the elements. Uh, you know, we, 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 we cel celebrate uh, your commitment to redeveloping urban centers. We know your background uh, is uh, in redeveloping Chelsea and urban centers. Uh, and your focus on economic strategies uh, to attract and retain new and innovative businesses. Uh, we're also fortunate to have your tenure. Uh, many uh, in your, <laughs> you know, of your predecessors were here two or three or four years, and you, you, you've committed and been here, and we hope to work with you uh, for many more years to come. <laughs> the Chamber and the uh, Metro South Regional Economic Development Organization, which is supported by the state and, and by Jay's office, have engaged uh, in local strategic partnerships and collaborations to provide infrastructure studies and advocacy to ensure the advancement of the region. And some examples of that are, among these are uh, the regional water and sewer study that we uh, commissioned uh, for the expansion of sewage from the regional uh, facility in Brockton out to the industrial parks and the commercial districts uh, in the region. Co uh, this coincided recently with the EPA uh, issuing a new permit for the facility in Brockton that will allow us now to connect to all of the surrounding towns. And I know we have some city councilors here and uh, the mayor uh, was supposed to be here. I think he's dealing with the snow right now, but I know he's speaking with you later on today. Uh, so he'll probably highlight the opportunity that's there to expand an employment base, not just in Brockton, but into the industrial parks and commercial districts in the region that can provide uh, opportunities for employees in Brockton and the surrounding towns. So we also completed and distributed land use studies on the 65-acre Brockton Fairgrounds. Yes, 65 acres. People don't realize that the Carneys have amassed 65 acres there. Uh, and a 35-acre CSX rail yard, which is right in downtown Brockton uh, near the police station uh, that sits there fallow and uh, is an opportunity for development. We hope to continue the dialogue around these developments and these parcels, uh, as well as the possible reuse of the Christos site. We lost Christos, which was our number one brand a few years back. Uh, there's some real energy now around the redevelopment of that parcel. 
Uh, I, know, I know that the mayor and the, uh, uh, the Board of Trustees of Massasoit are in sync with getting this property redeveloped. I know we've talked to the governor just in the last uh, month uh, he, when he was here, and I know Jay has followed up uh, on this. So we really hope to see so something happen there, and we're committed, Secretary, to uh, working with you to make that happen. Uh, we will work to, uh, to see the highest and best use of all these parcels because they don't just impact Brockton, they impact the entire region. There are not that many parcels that you can count uh, that, that number in the 30 to 60 acre uh, sites. In fact, one of the last ones was the Crown Linen site. Now George Spilios, the owner, is here. He took that former Howard Johnson site and redeveloped it, cleaned it up, redevelopment, and, and brought 150 new jobs and uh, a state-of-the-art facility. Thank you, George, for coming to Brockton. So we owe a great deal of gratitude to Governor Baker and Secretary Ash for the recent uh, state contributions to Main Street right in downtown Brockton. These include the relocation of the Plymouth County District Attorney Office. I mean, it was shameful really to see the building that they were in. I, I know it was a, a county-owned building, but it was really not appropriate for a professional uh, uh, outfit like uh, what we have in our uh, District Attorney. And it was probably the worst office in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, the governor uh, and Jay uh, assisted us in acquiring a new building downtown. And not only did they, uh, the district attorney gain new uh, offices, but they attracted 25 uh, state troopers from the Middlebarrow Barracks formerly. And now they're operating out of downtown Brockton, which is a nice addition to downtown. Most of them in plain clothes, and you don't see the cruisers, but they're investigators. And, and uh, it, it's helpful, I think, to have them there. They also are, uh, recently awarded Brockton $10 million to build a new parking garage and facility, which will uh, enable housing and mixed use to go on in that, right, that downtown area. Uh, in addition, uh, they have made a commitment to a new state administration office at the former Ganley Building uh, at the end of Belmont Street, and that is a major, major uh, investment. Uh, that will free up a, another state office on Main Street that uh, is now will be available, left in good, uh, good uh, condition, and will be available for mixed use as well. So uh, this is all really great stuff and that uh, the Secretary Jay Ash uh, and, the, and the Governor have done for Brockton since they've been in office. So we really, we, we really applaud that. Uh, at this time, I'd like to remind you, uh, the Secretary has offered to answer some questions at the end. Uh, there are some green sheets on your table. We asked you to write out your question and just hold it up. One of the Chamber staff will go around and grab it and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Um, we're, now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our host uh, and uh, our former board member and chairman of the board, uh, Fran Dillon of Stonehill College. Fran. <laughs> Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to Snowy Stonehill College. I'm happy to announce the only place in southeastern Massachusetts where it's snowing is right here. Once you leave, the sun will be out. It'll be 60 degrees. So, uh, Jay, it's great to have you here with us today. The governor has been to Stonehill College as governor, but even preceding that, he was here when he was in the healthcare industry. But years ago, he's told me that he used to come down to Stonehill regularly because a bunch of his buddies who were college students down here at the time, he would come down and play basketball with them in the old gym. So he's no stranger to Stonehill, and he's always welcome back. Um, this Martin Institute, Chris told you a little bit about its purpose. Um, I've been around a long time, so I was here when all that started, and it's a very quick but kind of fascinating story. Uh, it all began in 1961. Now, I wasn't at this meeting because I was 13 at the time, but <laughs> at the very first President's Dinner at Stonehill College, in this June we'll be celebrating the 58th President's Dinner, the very first one, we were honoring Richard Cardinal Cushing, the Archbishop Cardinal of Boston, because he had agreed to give us some money to build a new library. And we were going to name the library the Cushing Library. At that dinner, Joe Martin, who was the congressman for this area at the time, was also being recognized. And uh, they sat together in the dais, and they shared a lot of things in common, including scotch. And during the course of that meeting, Cardinal Cushing asked Joe Martin where his papers were going to go when he finished his public service. Joe wasn't a highly educated fellow. He was extremely bright and sharp and a great politician, but didn't have much of a formal education. He said he hadn't given it any thought. 
So Cushing said, well, if you give your papers to Stonehill, we'll call it the Cushing Martin Library, and that's exactly what happened. We opened the Cushing Martin Library, and in the basement was this tiny room that held all of Joe Martin's papers. Fast forward to about 1989, we had, Father McFadden and I had heard a rumor that there's money available in Washington to house the papers of former speakers of the house. So we went down there, now this is Tip O'Neill and Joe, Mar uh, Joe Moakley was our representative at the time. Silvio Conti was the only Republican representative in the whole congressional district. And we went down there to talk about this fund of money available. They said, there's no such thing. You have to write legislation, you have to bring it forward. So we did, and at that time was an era called Graham Rudman, which meant every authorization was being sliced when it got to appropriations. So we wanted to put a wing on the old library, the Cushing Martin Library, and we figured it would cost us about $3 million. So Joe Moakley and Silvio Conti and Ted Kennedy said, you better ask for twice that because what they'll do if you ask for $3 million, they'll cut it in half and you won't have enough money for your building. So we asked for $6.5 million, and to our surprise, we got it. <laughs> so we said, we can't put a wing on a building, and this is 1989, so you can imagine. We can't put a wing on a building for $6 million. That's the most expensive building we have on our entire campus. So thus became the Joe Martin Institute for Law and Society. And as Chris said, it's really not a college facility. It's a community facility. It's intended to be used for programs like this to educate and discuss and debate and come to solutions on public policies that affect our country, but most specifically southeast of Massachusetts. So this is why I think it's very appropriate, Jay, that you join us today to uh, share your wisdom with us. We have a great team of ambassadors, uh, many of them with us today, so I just want to ask you to hold your applause until tomorrow, but I'd like them all to stand to be recognized. Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank. Rayco McNeil, Bridgewater Savings Bank. See, you don't pay attention. <laughs> John King, Cirrus Inc. Murray Vetstein, Source 4. Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union. Brenda Karens, OCES. And Connie Hunt, the United Way. Thank you all for all the good work you do for the change. Many important public figures are in the audience, and I'm going to read the ones we know are here. If I miss you, I apologize. Um, in addition to our guest speaker, Jay Ash, State Representative Claire Cronin is here. <laughs> Brockton City Councilor Ann Beauregard. <laughs> Craig Barga from the town of Easton. <laughs> also from the town of Easton, Stephanie Danielson, Connor Reed. Connor Reed, Dottie Ful uh, Fulginetti, Michael Blanchett, I think this is Michael's first day on the job uh, representing Easton, so welcome Michael. Uh, from the town of Halifax, Charles Selig. <laughs> town of Stoughton, Mark Tisdale. <laughs> Frank Lyman from the town of Whitman. <laughs> and also from Whitman, Lisa Green. So welcome all to our public. There are many other important people in the audience, but I won't mention you. You know who you are. <laughs> I see everybody saying, yep, he's talking about me. So, so welcome to Stonehill. Uh, this morning, our sponsor <coughs> is Columbia Gas, and we're going to receive an update from, from Columbia Gas on their system modernization plan. Before we hear from Columbia Gas's manager of engineering, Dave Mueller, we'd like to play a short video introduction that will give you some background about the work that they're doing. There are many different kinds of companies providing services related to natural gas. Here's where we fit in at Columbia Gas of Massachusetts. It's our responsibility to deliver natural gas to warm your home, heat your water, and cook your food, and to maintain the pipelines used to deliver that gas to your home or business. In order to deliver natural gas to the many homes, schools, hospitals, stores, businesses, and factories in your community and across the state, we have thousands of miles of pipelines in our system. These pipelines are an essential part of our modern day infrastructure. And as with other types of infrastructure, like roads, dams, and bridges, deterioration occurs over time, and repairs or replacement are eventually needed. For many pipelines, that time is now. The old gas pipes installed in your neighborhood generations ago served us well. 
but they are now ready to be retired. That's why we launched an ambitious pipeline replacement program. If we do nothing, the cost to maintain and repair these older pipes will be higher than the cost to replace them. That wouldn't make sense. So we're taking proactive steps now to reduce cost to customers. Thanks to advancements in pipeline technology, since those old pipes were first put into service, state-of-the-art plastics are now used to create pipes more suited for underground use. They contract and expand with shifting temperature and bend to the contour of the earth around them. As a result, these plastic pipes will not only last longer, but they'll also require less maintenance, all of which saves money and allows us to maintain the safe, reliable, and efficient natural gas delivery service you currently rely on each day. As with any infrastructure improvement project, upgrading our natural gas delivery system may result in temporary inconveniences while work is underway. If work is ongoing in your area, we thank you for your patience and ask you to keep the long-term benefits in mind. You'll receive notification either through a letter, door hanger, or personal visit from a Columbia Gas of Massachusetts employee or contractor well before any work on or near your property begins. When you see the flags and paint markings identifying the location of underground gas pipelines and other utility lines, it's likely work will begin soon. We often use innovative pipe replacement techniques to limit the amount of digging required. When upgrading your service line, we may replace your gas meter and relocate it outdoors if it's currently inside your home. Our goal is always to keep any service interruption to a minimum. You'll be notified in advance of any temporary service interruption, which typically lasts only several hours. Care and caution are taken throughout the entire process, ensuring your safety and limiting any inconvenience. After a pipeline is replaced, we restore the area to its original condition in accordance with Massachusetts standards. We work with communities to coordinate our pipeline replacement work with other infrastructure projects to minimize inconvenience. And when installation is complete, public property, like streets and sidewalks, is restored to Massachusetts state requirements. At Columbia Gas of Massachusetts, we see our pipeline replacement program as an investment in the communities we serve. The upgrades we're doing now are part of our ongoing commitment to reliably deliver your natural gas safely and efficiently for generations to come. Uh, now here to talk more about the project is Dave Mueller, Manager of Engineering, who will be interviewed by our own Ray Ledoux from the Brockton Area Transit Authority. Please come forward. Good morning, everyone, and welcome, Dave. Thank you. And uh, thank you for being here. A great video. Uh, some of that could apply to modernization in healthcare as well, it seems, uh, with some of the piping work that you're doing. But, but um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, many of us remember uh, Bay State Gas here as the dominant, uh, one of the dominant uh, utility providers. Are they still around? What's happened? And are you the new, uh, is Columbia the new Bay State? Or what's happened to Bay State? So, Basically, in 1998, uh, Bay State Gas Company was purchased by what was then uh, called Nipsco Industries. It was a utility based out of Indiana, and um, for years and years, it, you know, it had remained at Bay State and you know maintained its its uh, identity. By 2000, um, Nipsco Industries purchased um, Columbia Gas Companies, which you know serve roughly five states, I believe, in the Midwest, Ohio, Virginia, uh, Pennsylvania, and the like. So <clears throat> essentially, at that time, that's when the corporation became NYSource. Um, and in 2010, Bay State Gas, which really was still Bay State Gas, I mean, the, the same employees still worked here and those kinds of things, um, for branding purposes, changed its name to Columbia Gas of Massachusetts. So. We're still really Bay State Gas. Uh, we're just operating under a different name. Okay, great. Now, uh, you noted some of the infrastructure work that uh, uh, is being done. And we know across the nation there's great need for infrastructure improvement and that uh, there's a lot to be done 
and uh, more to be done in terms of infrastructure improvement, not just roads and bridges, uh, water lines, sewer lines. Uh, can you tell us how Columbia Gas fits into the infrastructure environment and what you're doing to improve infrastructure? Right, thank you. So, <clears throat> essentially, Colum uh, Columbia Gas, we operate about 5,000 miles of gas uh, lines uh, across Massachusetts. Um, in the Brockton area, which comprises you know, roughly 41 cities and towns in and around um, the city of Brockton, we have about 1,300 miles of, of pipe. Um, about 16% or so of our total system, um, or about 708, 710 miles or so, um, basically are what we call um, leak prone infrastructure. Um, it was pipes that was installed you know, probably 100 years ago, uh, comprises of bare steel, cast iron, and those kinds of things. And while um, those pipes have served us very, very well, and they continue to serve us, um, serve our customers, you know, safely, you know, they're just at a point where, um, yeah, they're deteriorating faster than what we can repair them. So, you know, we've started to replace those. In the Brockton area, we uh, will be replacing about 200 to 210 miles of pipe over the next um, 10 to 15 years, probably depending on how aggressive we can get with our replacement programs. Um, probably been at this now for since aggressively since 2009. You know, through 2016, we've re we've replaced about 300 and some miles of pipe. Um, <clears throat> You know, with about uh, you know across the entire footprint of, of um, Massachusetts, and um, in 2014, House Bill 4161 really authorized what's really our, our program today. It was authorized the uh, creation of the Gas System Enhancement Plan. Um, that's a statewide initiative. You know, that I think probably the five major gas companies in the state are participating in. Um, and really what it called for was over the, over the next 20 years from 2015 through about 2034 that all of the aged infrastructure would be replaced. Um, you know, we're into it about four years now. I guess this is the fourth year. Um, last year we did about 50 miles of replacement. You know, we intend to continue to, to go at that pace. I'd like to kind of push it up to maybe 60, 65 miles of pipe a year if we can try to get done a little bit earlier, but um, essentially it's um, really designed to modernize the system so that, you know, we have, as you saw in the video, you know, the most modern materials with the most modern construction standards and practices and, you know, essentially um, really reduce the amount of uh, leakage. Um, you know, you probably see our trucks in your communities, you know, quite frequently, you know, fixing leaks and those kinds of things, you know, with this new infrastructure, you know, we're not going to have to do that anymore. No, I, I know that when my wife and I were first married some 35 years ago, we uh, bought a two-family in Brockton, built in 1885, old gas pipes and uh, gas plumbing in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. What is Columbia Gas doing to help improve the quality of life, you know, uh, in communities? and for uh, its customers? So, <clears throat> from an infrastructure point of view, you know, a big part of the program is designed to, you know, get to a point where, you know, we're no longer an inconvenience. You know, essentially, you know, we're not out in the front of people's houses in the middle of the night digging up the streets to repair gas leaks and that kind of thing. As you saw in the video, we'll get the meters moved outside so, you know, we won't have to gain access to do inspections and, and, and whatnot. Um, I think one of the things that um, is really core to our modernization program is really reliability, safety, <coughs> not necessarily in that order, and um, environmental stewardship. You know, one of the things that's been, you know, a real public interest is the, the associated impact of gas leaks on greenhouse gas emissions and that kind of thing. So, as a matter of fact, in 2017, the Department of, of Environmental Protection had issued some regulations that essentially has um, 
really asked all the gas companies to look at how can we continue to aggressively reduce <coughs> um, greenhouse gas emissions due to uh, uh, leaks and that kind of thing. So, you know, a big part of the program is really focused at reducing leaks, which has a safety component, but certainly has an environmental component as well. Now, I know you didn't have an opportunity to meet everybody here in the room, but just so you know who the audience was in the audience, we have the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, state legislators. We have the head of a regional planning agency responsible for some economic development. Right. Three CEOs from some very, very fine financial institutions, academicians. We could go on and on. So there's no pressure. No, here. no. Uh, <laughs> then, 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 then this question now is what does Columbia Gas, what's Columbia Gas's role in your, uh, in your view in terms of impacting <clears throat> or having positive economic impact on the region, the Metro South area, and the Commonwealth? There's no pressure. No, no, no. So, so the, the, the obvious one <coughs> is the fact that we're, over the course of um, 2034 or so, you know, we expect to invest about a billion dollars in infrastructure. You know, so that, that obviously is going to translate into um, increased property taxes. And, you know, we're generally, get, utilities typically are the, <coughs> um, if not the largest, one of the largest taxpayers in most communities. We expect, you know, across Massachusetts, um, probably looking at an incremental $30 million a year in, in property taxes. So that obviously is going to have some, some, some benefits. Um, one of the things that is really important, and kind of goes back to the first question you asked, and that has to do with, you know, the coordination of infrastructure improvement in general. Um, we try to focus our project selections year over year based on, you know, the, you know, the areas that are the most um, leak prone, you know, or that have the highest risk, <clears throat> and we do that pretty effectively. But the other thing is we, we, you know, we do our very best to coordinate our infrastructure improvements with that of the cities and towns, particularly like paving projects and those kinds of things. The one thing that's the worst thing that can happen is a city or town, you know, paves the street and six years later the gas company comes in and tears that all off to do its replacement. So, you know, one of the things that I'm really appreciative of and especially want to thank the legislature for passing House Bill 4161, <clears throat> which has given us the opportunity to get pretty aggressive with um, our replacement program is we've grown to the point where we're probably going to be able to just about match one for, you know, uh, street for street as things get paved. You know, we can get in there, do our infrastructure replacement, um, <clears throat> and then essentially the city comes in, paves the street, or does whatever infrastructure that they have to do as well. So at the end of the day, you know, the citizens, you know, end up with new gas lines, you know, very reliable, very safe. <clears throat> not leak prone so we won't be out there digging the streets up you know like we have in the past new streets new infrastructure and those kinds of things and I think the third piece of it is, is really around natural gas in general um, you know it is a preferred fuel you know we still have you know every year um, we're seeing very aggressive application for service by new customers um, developers definitely um, seek <clears throat> to have us install our facilities in, in their uh, new developments because it is a proper preferred fuel by a lot of customers. And so I think that having you know, a good in energy infrastructure and affordable energy that essentially customers you know, um, really um, value pretty highly is important towards you know, attracting you know, new um, housing developments and commercial developments and that kind of thing. And, and then the last question is, there are a number of municipal leaders here mm -hmm. and customers. What can we do to make your job easier? This is your chance to... Oh, my. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as far as... Um, one of the things that I think would be from, a, you know, from um, um, community leaders and those kinds of things, you know, continue to promote the, the collaboration between, you know, the, the efforts 
infrastructure improvement efforts in, in your communities with that of what we're doing. You know, and we're, you know, we're not perfect at it, but I think, you know, in the five or six years that I've been here, you know, we continue to get better and better at it. I think one of the things that is always of, um, I shouldn't say concern, but certainly, you know, it's, it's something that we that we have to deal with is the permitting process, you know, and, and you know we have to pull permits from the from the DPW or the city, you know, and and had and, and um, um, said before you know council to get you know our projects approved and that kind of thing. Whatever you can do to expedite that process so that we can be more flexible uh, in 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 our scheduling and planning, uh, so we can get that work done before. Um, before the cities get in there, that would be extremely helpful. And I think the, the, the one thing that I'm really focused on as the engineering manager is to try to become a little bit more forward thinking so that we're planning our projects, you know, probably like on a three year planning horizon to the extent that the cities and towns, um, you know, have those capabilities of planning, that, you know, their infrastructure as well. Um, you know, making sure that you're reaching out to us and, and uh, collaborating with us so that essentially we can be coordinated as best as possible would be extremely helpful. Well, we want to thank you for your forward thinking and actually we should really thank your crews and mechanics yeah, who are out there during the <laughs> sub-zero weather and maybe right. if we bring them a cup of uh, warm coffee that might be a good gesture on our part. That would be, as customers. That would so, be fantastic and they thank appreciate you, David. it. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your words and also for your sponsorship today. And Ray, as always, great job. Uh, just before I introduce our special guest speaker, I want to also welcome another state rep who has joined us this morning. Please welcome Kiko Oral. Kiko, thank you for being here. <laughs> Jay Ash serves as the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Secretary Ash is responsible for directing and executing Governor Charlie Baker's agenda on housing and community development, job creation, business development, consumer affairs, and business regulation. That's a lot. <laughs> Since joining the Baker Polito administration, Secretary Ash has prioritized efforts to grow jobs, help communities realize their economic development priorities, connect citizens to new economic opportunities, and build prosperity across Massachusetts. He has led efforts to increase affordable housing production, to redevelop and modernize public housing communities, and to substantially reduce the number of homeless families sheltered in motel rooms. Secretary Ash has also played a leadership role in the recruitment and expansion of major employers, including Amazon and General Electric. Secretary Ash previously served as the city manager in his native Chelsea, Massachusetts, a position he held from 2000 to 2014. Please welcome Secretary Jay Ash. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for that warm welcome. Uh, uh, my joke for you relative to the weather is, for those of you who have only seen me here at the chamber events, uh, please know that I do to go to other places and don't bring snow with me. Uh, I've been here twice and both times it's been snowing out, so uh, as I was driving down I was thinking about the last time I was here. The good news is that this is my second visit to the Stonehill campus. Uh, last time I found myself driving uh, over snow-covered walkways because they were wide enough for a car to get around, so there were some students that were dodging me as I was driving around. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with uh, all of you. I uh, first and foremost want to thank you for being part of a chamber. Uh, it's important as uh, we try to do all that we do, us uh, public officials, that we have uh, business partners uh, who uh, we can work with. And your collaboration in the chamber makes sure that your voice is heard, uh, that you have advocates like Chris uh, who are uh, in contact with us and talking to us about your particular individual company needs, but also the collective needs of of the business community. So uh, congratulations to all of you for uh, your commitment to the chamber and know that uh, we much, very much value uh, that commitment. We know that your time maybe could be better spent back at your office uh, doing what you do, but uh, you give of yourself and uh, you make a difference to the chamber. So uh, thank you all for being a part of that. Um, 
Speaking about people who give time, I just want to give a shout out to a couple of people. Jim Blake from uh, Harbor One Bank uh, is a member of our Mass Development Board, and uh, we're very uh, fortunate. You know, I sit on the board with him, and, and uh, we take up the affairs of the day for Mass Development. And as I as I look around the table, I, I think to myself, boy, are we fortunate to have a Jim Blake uh, sitting at the table bringing his business acumen but also his sense of community uh, to every meeting. So, Jim, thank you for your uh, service to us. Uh, another uh, local guy who um, uh, I don't know how his business does as well as he it does, as well as it does. Uh, Mike Tomasi at uh, Accurounds is uh, probably the foremost champion of manufacturing here in Massachusetts and among the most uh, recognized around the country. Uh, spends time with me, but reminds me all the time that he's actually been at the White House, so it's no big deal uh, to be with me. But um, Mike at Accurance has a, a terrific business, but uh, gives of himself to make sure that uh, manufacturing has a, a voice in. Um, as a result, manufacturing is on the rise here in Massachusetts. And so, Mike, uh, congratulations on your work, and thank you for everything you do. And it, uh, it probably wouldn't be a vent that, you know, I, I drive myself around, but uh, Bob Rivers, maybe you and I should drive together. Where's Bob? Uh, Bob, maybe we should drive together from now on and we could save some uh, mileage. It seems like everywhere I go, uh, Bob Rivers is to be found. Uh, Bob, uh, of course, uh, runs Eastern Bank, but um, I think his real passion is community development. And uh, I suspect that uh, he follows me around because uh, when I leave, he's going to be calling the governor. Uh, to see if he might be able to slide into uh, to be secretary. Um, he, uh, Bob's uh, impact on uh, gateway cities, on uh, people who have um, um, been disenfranchised, uh, people who uh, need a little extra uh, to be able to grab that next uh, rung of their own personal ladder of success is really remarkable. And uh, Bob, I admire you so much for everything you do, and uh, thanks for making a difference, uh, not only in the banking community, but in all of our communities. So thanks, Bob. So, Chris, I can go on and talk about everybody at the table if you prefer, but uh, 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 maybe I should go. Mary, I'll catch you next time. Bob Krenzman, who's an old friend of mine from Chelsea days, is here. I haven't seen Bob in ages, so it's uh, great to see Bob. George, uh, who works at the TDI in Brockton, uh, thanks for uh, all you do. I can continue to go on and on and on. Where's Dan from, East, uh, from Easton? Uh, Dan's around someplace. Oh, there's Dan. Uh, just tremendous work in Easton. We were uh, there recently uh, to announce another grant to Easton to help the downtown. And so, uh, so many of you have done so many work, uh, so many, uh, so much good work. John tells me he's going to bring me a suit the next time. So, um, I've been in the back of, of John's uh, shop in downtown Brockton and looked at all of the old tuxedos. I hope the suit isn't lime green. John. That's what I. He's not making. You're not committing to that. <laughs> uh, so um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, what we've been up to and, and where we're going um, and do so in a kind of quick matter. I, I, I guess I have to, I should set the table for you. Um, how many of you are happy with what you see in Washington these days? Raise your hand. Really? So, so, man, that's a mess. Uh, there's always one in the crowd that says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I would suggest that um, uh, the rancor and divisiveness that um, happens in Washington um, is, um, is the antithesis of what's happening in Beacon Hill, on Beacon Hill. Uh, we have a very good thing going on right now where Republicans and Democrats have figured out uh, how to work together. And uh, instead of uh, slinging arrows and doing the blocking and tackling that's involved in bad politics, uh, we said are rolling up our sleeves and, and doing good work around uh, great public policy. Um, happy to work with a guy who's um, probably nonpartisan would be the best way to describe him, but be uh, bipartisan um, at his very root, and uh, that's Governor Baker. And you know, I've said before, I may have said here that uh, the nice thing about working in the Baker administration, Father Governor, is that he doesn't care about the uh, Republican way of doing things or the Democratic way of doing things. Uh, he only cares about the right way of doing things, and it's helpful for me as a Democrat in the Republican administration. Uh, to know that uh, every time I face a, a decision uh, that needs to be made, that as long as I'm doing the right thing, um, I'll have the full support of the governor. That's been uh, tremendous. Um, as happy as I am about that, it takes two to tango. I think about uh, any Indiana Jones fans out here? I uh, remember the first Indiana Jones movie where he's in the bazaar and he's about to uh, take on this uh, big hulking guy and uh, the big hulking guy's got the sword and he starts doing this with the sword and Indy's looking at him like, what am I going to do? And then Indiana, take, Indiana takes out a gun and shoots him. Um, 
The thing is, if you don't have partners um, who are willing to play the same game, uh, then um, it makes it uh, all the more difficult to really do the right thing um, each and every day. And so we're very fortunate to have in the legislature great partners uh, led by Democrats in both the House and the Senate, uh, but really interested in making good public policy. So I, I congratulate you all uh, for sending uh, the legislators you do uh, to Boston. They uh, carry the message about uh, this region, but they also care about uh, making good public policy for the Commonwealth and, and the difference is being felt. So uh, uh, Claire's here, uh, uh, Keiko is here. I see Representative Dubois is in the back of the room has come here and, and others. Um, thank you for sending people that uh, really want to work with us as opposed to fight about things that shouldn't be thought about. And uh, I like to think that the difference is being felt and we're recognized around the country as the number one state. And it's the number one state by independent authorities. So uh, U.S. News and World Report recently put out their first uh, compilation, and the number one overall state in the country is Massachusetts. Um, that's good to know from our perspective. We feel like we've contributed to that, but it's, all, it's about all of us. It's the number one uh, state to work in and, and to live in and to learn in. Um, so there's lots of good things going on, and uh, it's a result of, of the work that we're all uh, doing together. The bipartisan, nonpartisan uh, feel uh, that happens up at uh, Beacon Hills, great. Uh, maybe some of you have already tweeted out. I said, who, when Seti Warren came up? But uh, Seti's a good friend. Uh, um, you know, Jay Gonzalez, uh, a good friend. I, I wish them the, the best of luck on their run. And, and uh, um, well, the best of luck is really during the primary, but um, uh, I wish them the best of luck. And uh, it's actually, it's great that people are stepping up and in, in being involved. Uh, you know, to me, democracy um, is best served when uh, people from both sides of the aisle uh, run for office, uh, raise issues, and have a um, spirited debate. Uh, but that spirited debate is really about uh, good public policy as opposed to bad politics. So uh, look forward to the challenges that are ahead. Um, on the political side, but uh, really feel good about where we are um, on the administrating of uh, government side. Um, some highlights of, of things that uh, I've been working on and that uh, we are most proud of. You know, when the uh, governor came into office, uh, one of the commitments that he made was that he wanted to end the use of hotels and motels uh, for families uh, who are homeless. Uh, so when we came into office, we had just over 1,500 uh, families that were scattered around the Commonwealth in 49 hotels. Uh, today, as I stand before you, uh, there are less than 60 uh, families, so we've gone from 1,500, over 1,500 to less than 60. We've gone from 49 hotels to just two. i um, really excited about uh, those numbers, but more importantly, to put a more human face on it, uh, those 1,500 families had more than 3,000 kids in hotels and motels, an average stay of over six months. Kids in hotels and motels without kitchens, without places to even do homework. Um, and what we've been able to do is systematically go hotel from hotel uh, to find uh, either better shelter opportunities or permanent housing uh, for those families. As a, as a total result, uh, we're down over 25% in our um, homeless population, our family homeless population. And it's been a priority of, of the governor's, it's been a priority of mine, it's been a priority of uh, the legislators who are here and others. And um, if we do nothing else, you know, I'm excited about having brought GE to Massachusetts. I'm excited about getting a billion dollar economic development bill done. But if there was only one thing, only one thing that we would accomplish, uh, doing right by homeless families and especially doing right by those kids and giving them a better shot, shot at a great life is really important. So uh, very proud of that. So I'll talk about some other, uh, some other interesting things. I mentioned that billion dollar economic development bill. Um, so uh, Republicans and Democrats came together and passed a billion dollar bill to promote uh, economic development in our communities around the Commonwealth. I mean, think about the bipartisan spirit there and really think about the Democratic mindset. Democratic leaders saying, hey, Republican governor, we're going to give you a billion dollars to go around and give checks out to communities to uh, help them uh, grow jobs, help them revitalize their communities, and especially to uh, help those two uh, communities and, and businesses um, provide a path for people to prosper. Um, a billion dollars, it's really, uh, really incredible. And you know, the, the governor says to me all the time, Jay, everywhere I go, I hear great things about you. And I say to him, Governor, if you give me another $100 million to give out in grant money, you'll hear even better things about me. But, 
it really shows that how um, uh, Democrats are have put aside uh, partisan politics and said, let's make good public policy and let's give the governor the tools necessary to go back to our cities and towns and make investments in those cities and towns. So. Uh, we uh, got a bill adopted two Augusts ago, so just over a year and a half. About 40% of our communities have already derived the benefit from that economic development bill. Uh, we're doing things like a MassWorks program, which is the most popular program, and it's a classic economic development uh, program where we make investments in public infrastructure, and as a result of that investment in public infrastructure, uh, private investment takes place afterwards. Uh, that private investment is creating thousands of housing units desperately needed here in Massachusetts and creating uh, thousands of jobs in businesses that are growing, uh, like uh, AccuRounds. Uh, uh, AccuRounds isn't a beneficiary, but a, a business that's growing. And it's helping us to bring in uh, companies like uh, GE and uh, maybe Amazon. Uh, so uh, the MassWorks program has really set up our communities uh, to grow. And uh, as a former municipal manager, uh, uh, 14 years in the, uh, my native uh, Chelsea, um, I know how important the state support is to help put projects over the top and help to allow uh, for the local economy to grow. Um, other programs that have been exciting that we've been able to do is uh, uh, to focus on brownfields, uh, those contaminated sites, uh, especially in older urban communities, uh, to transform those into opportunities. Created new programs to establish new industrial parks and business parks. Uh, an exciting one just a little bit south of here in New Bedford, the uh, Welling City Golf Course is uh, being programmed uh, to be a nine-hole golf course, and the other nine holes will turn into an opportunity for more than a million square feet of development, bringing much-needed jobs and investment um, into New Bedford. Uh, so we're able to do things like that. Something that Brockton has benefited from directly is our efforts to promote uh, co collaborative workspaces in communities. Uh, so Massachusetts is recognized around the country and the world as being number one in innovation, number one in entrepreneurship. Uh, that's great for the Commonwealth, and we see a lot of that happening. We believe that innovation and entrepreneurship exists on the local level as well, and so we want to foster uh, the potential for innovation and entrepreneurship by partnering with communities, partnering with organizations uh, that support innovation and entrepreneurs, and as a result, we've made more than 50 grants over the last year and a half uh, to help those organizations and, and communities flourish. Uh, we've done uh, more on job training, providing uh, f approximately $15 million a year to partner with community colleges and vocational schools to buy the equipment necessary uh, to train people in the next generation of, of whatever they're going to go off to do in, in the business world. Uh, so excited about that. So lots of good things happening as a result of that economic development program. Uh, we've uh, focused on housing, not only in the economic development bill that was adopted, but elsewhere. And as a result, I've uh, seen uh, thousands of units uh, created uh, over the last three years. And I've set a goal, an ambitious, but we think an achievable goal, of seeing 135,000 uh, new units created here in Massachusetts uh, over the next seven years. Uh, so the possibilities exist for us to set up ourselves uh, to enjoy even more uh, success as we go forward. And some of the things that uh, we're working on, uh, we're thinking about include, uh, we filed another housing bond bill with the legislature. Uh, we have a, a $1.5 billion program to provide for more affordability. Uh, in uh, communities that need affordability as we work uh, separately on bringing market rate housing uh, to places uh, like Brockton that uh, need market rate housing, especially in their downtowns, uh, to attract people who have disposable income uh, to shop in our uh, stores, to eat in our restaurants, and uh, every now and then to, to uh, rent a tuxedo. There we go. Not buy the tuxedo, rent the tuxedo. So. Um, we have filed a, a half a billion dollar package uh, to expand our efforts around life sciences. Uh, Massachusetts is number one in the country around life sciences. 19 of the top 20 life sciences uh, companies in the world have presences here in Massachusetts. The thing with the life sciences bill that's important to us is that uh, when you go around the world and you talk about Massachusetts and life sciences, the first thing somebody says is Cambridge. And it's important that we continue to make sure that Cambridge is a strong center of life sciences in the world. But uh, our bill is aimed at stretching out the successes of the life sciences throughout um, all the corners of the Commonwealth. We believe that research and development around uh, institutions, including like Stonehill College, are important. Uh, but we also think that there are opportunities around manufacturing 
uh, to bring uh, manufacturing jobs, good manufacturing jobs with high wages uh, to all of our gateway cities around the Commonwealth. So I'm um, excited about uh, potential for life sciences. Uh, the governor and I are working on another economic development bill. So successful has the first one been that we're uh, looking at the second one. And um, just as the first economic development bill was uh, based on conversations that we all have had uh, over the, uh, the first year and a half of the administration when we filed the bill, um, this bill will be uh, based upon uh, continuing conversations. This past May, uh, we held uh, more than a dozen uh, listening sessions for small businesses focused on small business and had more than 250 small businesses come out uh, to tell us what they hope for, what they need, uh, what they're looking forward to from a partnership with the Commonwealth. And so the economic development bill will file will be uh, heavy on helping small businesses while continuing to provide uh, the traditional tools that exist uh, for um, business support uh, no matter what size, no matter what uh, industry you're in. Uh, so the, the good news um, is that there's lots to be positive about. Um, some of the challenges that exist um, include those very businesses that are growing. It's not unusual for me, and I'll uh, let all of you think about it yourself in the businesses you represent. It's not unusual for me to go into a business and hear that their number one challenge is attracting talent. That we have companies that are actually uh, restricting their growth because they don't have the talent to meet the orders and want to be able to fulfill uh, the expectations of their customers. So recognizing that, uh, the governor um, is working with uh, all of his cabinet uh, to do everything we can to um, increase uh, talent, make sure that uh, talent that's coming out of our schools um, is ready uh, to take on the jobs that are uh, available in, in great companies around the Commonwealth, uh, but also making sure that adults uh, who are in need of retraining or adults who have been on the sidelines uh, will get into the workforce. And so uh, programs and, and efforts around that are, uh, are important to us. Um, and I'm, I'm also working on regional strategies. So uh, the first year, uh, first two years of, of my work was really to focus on uh, the entire Commonwealth. But uh, both the governor and I are, are examples of uh, one size doesn't fit all. Um, I typically buy a piece of clothing that says one size fits all. I try it once, Fran, I imagine you're in the same direction, and then you look for somebody to give the clothing to because it doesn't fit. So um, the one size fits all is a good way to start um, a uh, economic development uh, effort, uh, but we recognize that uh, more tailoring needs to be done to uh, local regions. So the governor has charged me uh, with looking at seven regions of the Commonwealth and figuring out uh, economic development plans for those seven regions and uh, getting back to where I started uh, that's where the Metro South Chamber of Commerce plays an important role. So we check in uh, with our partners like uh, the Chamber. We check in uh, with partners in academia. We check in with business leaders uh, like Accurounds and others uh, to talk about, all right, let's look at the region now and, and how we help the region. Regional transportation is important and the housing issues uh, that exist to make sure that uh, people have affordable quality housing near where they work. Uh, is really critical. So in summary, I uh, feel good about uh, where we are. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned my tenure. I think it was Chris mentioned my tenure in office. Uh, look at me as the canary in the coal mine. If you see me leaving the state government, that means the recession is on its way. Otherwise, uh, I'd, have to be, I'd have to be crazy to leave because uh, the economy is doing well. And um, this is quite literal. Once a week, I'm getting a call from a company, usually from out of state, but sometimes from in-state. And those calls aren't hey, Jay, we're thinking about creating dozens of jobs or even scores of jobs, and we need your help. Uh, those calls are, hey, Jay, we're thinking about hundreds, if not thousands, and in some cases tens of thousands of jobs uh, that people want to expand here or bring here to Massachusetts. So it's a really terrific time uh, to take advantage of a great economy. Um, our job is to jam-pack as much of the economic development, uh, as much as the vitality as we can around to as many places as we can, and be prepared for uh, uh, anything that may happen into the future. All of you are an important part of that. So as you're growing your companies, um, as you're working in collaboration with companies, as uh, you represent your communities, and um, as you think about uh, how to best help people prosper, uh, feel free to call upon us. Uh, either directly to me, through your legislators, through places like the uh, Metro South uh, Chamber of Commerce, and know that uh, we'll look forward to taking the call and look forward to working with all of you. Uh, so thanks all of you. Uh, thanks for all of you being here, and I think we're going to do a little question and answer. I'm only taking softball uh, questions. Um, I've been working on my right, best I'll Bill Bill Chuck. So yeah, yeah, exactly. No softballs. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone.
how the Baker administration deals with economic development strategies and how you work with your other cabinet colleagues? That's a, that's a really interesting question. It was about um, on a six or eight months in, George, you may remember the time. Uh, uh, um, I was sitting around the table with, um, with my partners in what we call a development cabinet. So the Secretary of Transportation, Stephanie Pollack, the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, Matt Beaton, and I meet uh, every third week uh, individually. And then with our staff, we meet every other week. And we run through the litany of projects that are out there to make sure that we have a coordination. Um, so about six or eight months in, and I recognize that uh, we're talking about economic development, and I probably have less to do a, about economic development than my partners around the table. If you think about it, transportation is a critical part of getting people back and forth to work, and as companies are talking about growing, they're asking about how we're going to get people back and forth. So, uh, Secretary Pollack, I need your help. And uh, when it comes to expansions, um, you think about permitting and environmental regulations and the like, and Matt Beaton is in charge of permitting. So um, I rely upon our partners, and the governor uh, relies upon us. We meet with the governor once a month to talk about uh, where we are, and then I meet individually with the governor uh, to uh, discuss individual projects. So there's one set of uh, collaborators I have. The other set of collaborators I have is that the uh, governor feels so strongly about workforce that he has uh, charged the Secretary of Education, uh, Jim Pizer, the Secretary of Labor, uh, Rosalind Acosta, and myself uh, to also meet every other week uh, to work on uh, workforce development plans. So we spend an awful lot of time uh, talking with each other about um, how we can uh, make a difference on the agenda of economic development as a big picture, workforce development as a big picture, but are really narrowing down on specific things we can do in the regions. That last group, the three secretaries, Labor, Education, and I, we've been um, meeting uh, with regional uh, collaborators, including some in this room, uh, to look at regional plans to support economic development. So what's important um, in a place like Boston may not be as important as a place uh, like Brockton or especially in Pittsfield. So tailoring uh, workforce strategies to, uh, uh, to areas like that is important. And then the people that hold the purse strings, uh, ANF, we've been fortunate to have uh, two ANF secretaries who have really embraced economic development, and the governor who has given me uh, given all of us uh, more and more resources, even though we've uh, been balancing budgets by uh, cutting accounts, the governor feels so strongly about economic development and especially housing development uh, that my accounts have actually been increased uh, during those budget cutting times. Okay, talking about workforce development, 59% uh, of adults uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities are unemployed, not by choice and not because they can't work. Where do you see them fitting in with the regional economic Strategies. Yeah, whoever asked that, I assume that you work in that area, and I want to thank you for your work in that area. Uh, one of the causes that I've recently take up, uh, taken up myself is uh, more attention to people with disabilities, or, or as I like to say, different abilities. And um, I think we need to look at uh, the opportunity to engage every single person in the Commonwealth in a, uh, I call it a prosperity plan, but um, a path for them uh, to be able to achieve everything uh, that they can. Uh, so uh, we have uh, that uh, workforce cabinet um, has spent a considerable amount of time talking about um, how to help people with different abilities uh, to uh, gain access or, or better improve their lot uh, through work. And um, we have been talking with advocates up at uh, Beacon Hill, um, some legislators about it, and uh, looking forward to continuing to uh, tailor um, uh, specific programs, but also make sure that our general programs have uh, room in them to support uh, job training, transportation, um, and uh, assistance on the work uh, in the work site. Uh, this is a good segue for, for what you just mentioned. This is about uh, uh, big cities and economic development of large companies. How will your office address the fight of larger businesses uh, being attracted to the suburbs? Uh, related to going into a gateway city, like the Reeboks or the New Balances. How do you uh, focus economic development in the gateway cities rather than the large developers in the suburbs? Yeah, I actually am seeing a different thing happening. So, um, you know, the flight from cities was really an 80s thing um, and uh, continued on into the 90s. But there's an interesting thing happening now that uh, uh, people are, are flocking back to cities and as a result, businesses are following them. Um, not in this region, but some of you may have recently seen that uh, Phillips uh, has uh, announced that they're moving their corporate headquarters from Andover, just about 20 miles north of Boston, uh, down to Cambridge. Uh, 
It was really interesting move, and when, when, when I talk to GE about moving into the state, or now I'm talking to Amazon about expanding into the state, it's one thing, but when you have a company that's in Massachusetts, that has a sprawling 160-acre campus and has been quite happy in their location for uh, decades, decide that they need to pick up and move to the city, um, that's a really telling sign. I, I sometimes joke that if I own property that had woods in it, you know, like Avon Woods Park, I might, um, I might think about selling because I, I think right now there's a strong gravitational pull to cities. As a result of that, every city, not only Boston, every city has an opportunity. Um, I grew up, I managed Chelsea. Chelsea was uh, probably the, uh, the basket case of the, of the 80s and 90s, and yet uh, with a little bit of good management, with a little bit of vision, and with this trend of uh, people and businesses looking to move in, uh, we were able to do 33 major projects there. So um, there's an opportunity that hasn't existed for gateway cities in quite some time. And being from a gateway city, being from a, an older urban place that uh, once uh, was the, the center of vitality for a region and then fell in hard times, uh, it's a great opportunity. And I'm, I'm glad to work with uh, uh, people like Mayor Carpenter uh, here to, uh, to make things happen. Besides, you know, uh, talking about some of the notable opportunities, uh, GE, maybe the potential of Amazon, yeah. Uh, what opportunities do you think for companies to come to Brockton or this region or gateway cities? What types of companies do you think are ripe to come to a gateway city? So I play a little game with myself. Uh, don't tell any business about this. Right? This is just between us, but um, new business will call and say, hey, we're thinking about Massachusetts. And the game is how long will it take for them to mention Kendall Square or the Seaport District? Yeah. <laughs> Usually it's under a minute. Um, so. There is a challenge that we have. Um, the Massachusetts economy is known around the world as Boston and Cambridge. And my philosophy is uh, bring them in to Boston and Cambridge, if that's what they're thinking about, um, and then get them to spread their wings and, and see the uh, great opportunities that exist throughout the rest of the Commonwealth. So um, in terms of big companies like Amazon and GE, uh, Having them familiar with us um, is going to allow us to then talk to them about places like distribution centers in Fall River or, um, or uh, GE Health in, in Marlboro. It's great opportunities there. Um, for the other gateway cities, the Brocktons of the world, um, I would suggest that first and foremost, you take care of who you have and help them to expand. Uh, W.B. Mason's uh, presence um, in Brockton is significant. Um, it's something that I say thank you to every time I go to see W.B. Mason. The decision that we made, uh, that the governor made, and I was able to carry out to invest $10 million in a downtown Brockton parking garage was in part because W.P. Mason is right there, and we feel like we owe it to W.B. Mason to help uh, resolve uh, some of those uh, parking problems. And by doing all that, you hope that W.B. Mason continues to do what it's been doing, which is a remarkable uh, growth. So I encourage mayors, I encourage managers, I encourage economic development professionals to first look from within, uh, help AccuRound go from 50? 75, wow, right? So there's an example. When we first met, I think you had 49. A little more than that. And so, uh, so mics growing 10% a year. You get a whole bunch of mics growing 10% a year and, um, and that's a really good story. So we try to help local businesses first and then to the extent that we can, when we get outside calls from businesses, we try to match them uh, with the uh, mayor, with the planners, with the uh, legislators' vision for what their community is. And we're having some success doing that, especially around manufacturing, I'm sure. Okay, uh, just two questions left, and I'll leave these sheets with you. So okay, great. Take with you, you'll be uh, kind enough to yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. I, I very much appreciate the feedback. This is very helpful. So uh, this is a specific question that the governor has heard and that you've heard uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, given the close uh, working relationship between the mayor and the leadership of Massasoit Community College, how might the state, through your leadership, make progress in developing the Fort Cristo site into a positive addition to the city? Are there any specific uh, resources that you could deploy uh, to help move this project along? Uh, the answer is yes and yes. Um, so uh, governor was down here. I'll talk to you all. 
Uh, Governor was down here, talked to you all, came back and uh, talked to me about uh, what he had heard relative to the opportunities and uh, what we should be doing. Uh, truth be told, I am uh, an hour and a half away from meeting with the mayor uh, to talk about the Crystal site and some other things. Uh, mayor Carpenter sent his uh, regrets that he had to deal with the uh, uh, storm issues, but I'm going to uh, go back to Brockton City Hall at 1030. Um, we're, uh, we very much believe that, um, that the vision for the local economy starts on the local level. And um, vision really is about leadership, and uh, Brockton's got great leadership. Um, so we're excited to work with the mayor. We're excited to work with the legislative delegation here and have, have, have had individual conversations uh, with each of them. When you add in another layer, which is the Brockton Partnership, um, you start to get a sense of there's a coordinated, collaborative uh, effort, coordinated, collaborative effort uh, to make uh, development happen. And so my job is actually kind of easy. I, I got to come in. Um, just uh, do a gut check to make sure that people are thinking the right way. An example would be I went to, I once went to a, a community, I won't name the community, but I once went to a community and uh, their hope, their first hope for economic development was a drive-in theater. And I said, huh? In a nice way. And um, took the conversation of a drive-in theater to a major mixed-use uh, uh, mixed development, uh, which has uh, some promise of happening. So. Um, I need to gut check against uh, what I know about economic development, but then uh, our job is to help fill in some of the gaps. And uh, when it comes to Christos, uh, we look forward to working with the city and uh, with uh, Massasoit, and I believe right now that there's a really good plan out there and that uh, we just need to make sure the plan can be effectuated and then uh, we'll help fill in some of the gaps. The last question is there are a number of municipal leaders here and a number of advocates for projects, whether it be redevelopment of CSX, housing in downtown, uh, educational expansion and uh, opportunities. Can you give some advice to the municipal leaders and those advocates as to how to bring a project forward? Does a community give you a list of six projects and a menu you pick, or does the community bring a priority list with a criteria? What makes it easier for you and what do you think is more successful? Yeah, it's a great question. It's really about uh, what the local leadership um, envisions and can deliver upon. So one of the successes that we had in Chelsea, uh, again, 33 major projects done in the city, and um, I had so many projects going on that I, and I felt pretty good about the relationships I had. I grabbed one of the developers. Uh, she was a hotel developer. And uh, she was on maybe Hotel 3. She's done five hotels in Chelsea. Mind you, uh, prior to, um, uh, the work that uh, we were able to do, the city council, myself, to bring hotels to Chelsea, uh, the only hotel we had in the city. Uh, Krenzman, you remember this, it, it rented by the hour, not by the night. So um, to bring hotels to the city was really something. And, and here's, a, here's a woman, a developer, uh, who not only did one, not only did two, but was doing three and had visions of five. And I said to her, why Chelsea? And what she said to me is that uh, you all get it. You've set up a process uh, that is clear and um, and is, um, uh, gives us a, a, a certain path uh, to either a yes or, more importantly, to a no. And so what I always suggest to communities is, uh, number one, be realistic about what your opportunities are. Uh, GE is only going to one city. Uh, Amazon's only going to one city. But be realistic about GE and Amazon uh, maybe having presences here in Massachusetts give us opportunities uh, to help grow our local uh, 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 workforce and, and businesses. W.B. Mason will have a shorter drive. Uh, to GE's corporate headquarters, for example. Um, so be realistic about what you're going after. And secondly, and, and uh, as importantly, make sure the process uh, that somebody has to go through um, is, um, is uh, very effective. I have sat across from developers any number of times and uh, like to have a joke or two with them. And I, I, I say to them, you know, you're here in front of me uh, asking for my opinions about development. Well, you need to know something. I've never developed anything before in my life. Um, it's important that municipal officials recognize that, that the expertise is really um, on the other side of the table when it comes to development and marketing and financing and all those things. What we bring on the municipal side is we know the, the, the permitting process, we know the relationships process, and we know how development can plug into an overall master plan. So uh, the third bit of advice is uh, know yourself, look in the mirror and know yourself what your role is in the development uh, uh, process. I, my, uh, my efforts were always to find good people, good developers, and then give them a lot of latitude. You know, I would interview them about who they were and what their mindset was. 
um, and then work with them. The developers I work with tended to stay in the city as opposed to build and leave, you know, build and sell, uh, because I knew that they would have a vested interest in the community. So there's plenty of opportunities out there. Uh, small town and large. I have several projects that are more than $100 million each going on in small communities. I spent six hours last week um, in a small community in western Massachusetts, and I thought to myself as I was leaving there, the six hours that I've just spent in this community is probably five hours and 45 minutes more than all the other secretaries combined have ever spent in this community, and yet there's an opportunity for a $100 million project there. So the opportunities are there. It's important that you have a process that um, allows for those opportunities to grow. Well, Secretary, we have to change, but we thank you. Well, it's thank so you very much. It's so easy to see the enthusiasm you bring to the job energy that you just exude from every pore as you speak. <laughs> and we do truly appreciate your advocacy and support in this region. Great. So thank, thank you. Thank you, very thank much. you everyone for being here. Jay, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to welcome you to the Metro South communities. Uh, just before we close, a few notes, but I, I know she came in a little late, but I want to make sure that we acknowledge her. And we have State Representative Michelle Dubois who joined us. Welcome, Michelle. <laughs> and for 44 years, I've been at Stonehill and in, in this community. And I would say that the last few years have been the most optimistic years of my time in this community. And I think it's due to three reasons. The first reason is the kind of individual today, in spite of the fact that it's a much harder job than it's ever been, to put themselves in line and serve the public as a public servant. Whether you're a state official, a local official, a city official, uh, we have people that are really committed to making our communities better, and that's number one. Number two, and Jay kind of referenced it as he went around the room. By the way, if he didn't mention your name, it's got to be in the official minutes because there's only three of you he didn't mention. But, but the business leaders in this community, the education leaders and the nonprofit leaders, they always go out of their way to try to get something done positive for the Metro South area and for the city of Brockton. So we're blessed. But all that being said, you need a catalyst to make sure that this all works, that the communication of the other programs are there. And to that, we owe a debt of thanks to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, its leader, Chris Cooney, and his staff, who do a great job. But Chris and his staff couldn't do it without the volunteer leadership, and particularly recently, we have a lot of former board chairs in the room who have done a great job, including Ray, who has been up here, Bill Morse from Mutual Bank. Um, but our current leadership and our immediate past leadership have just done such a great job bringing our communities together, solving the real important problems facing our community. So a real uh, nod to Jerry Nadeau, the president of, so of I was gonna say Sovereign Bank, Jerry, <laughs> of Rockland Bank, who is really, truly a, a man of this area and does a great job, not only for Rockland, but for this entire community. We're so blessed to have you as our chair, Jerry. <laughs> And it's, it's sometimes unusual to have a nonprofit leader lead a chamber, but the chamber made a great decision a few years ago, uh, appointing Sue Joss as the chairperson of the chamber, and Sue just stepped down from the position recently. So for your work and for the entire chamber board and for Chris's leadership, uh, I thank you, and uh, uh, you do great work for us, and you're always welcome here at Stonehill College. Two upcoming notes, uh, really good ones. We have a busy February, and there'll be no snow in February, I promise. <laughs> Our next Good Morning Metro South program will be held on Wednesday, February 7th, from 7.30 to 9 at the Moakley Center of the Good Samaritan Medical Center. The breakfast is sponsored by Old Colony Elder Services and will feature a great speaker. He is the Chief Economist and Investment Officer, Michael Tyler of Easton Bank. So please come and hear what Michael has to say about the economy. And also, we're happy to announce our third annual Multicultural Business Forum in After Hours, which will take place on Thursday, February 22nd at the Perfect Place on Main Street in Brockton. The event runs from 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m., features a resources expo, a minority and women-owned business panel, and great networking opportunities. And now we have a couple of door prizes to present. Um, one company will be highlighted in our action report, and this month's winner is Evans Machine and Dan Evans. Congratulations, Dan. I usually leave with a philosophical quote from a great Irish philosopher, Hal Roach, and he says, and you've heard it before, live each day as if it's going to be your last. 
and one day you'll be right. Have a great day, everybody.